today, uh, second Sunday lunch, we're going to cancel that because we've got freezing rain predicted for right afternoon, uh, so rather than anybody having to risk their car or uh, other things, uh, we'll just defer that to February. Uh, all the activities for the week and for upcoming Bible studies are in your insert, you can, you can leave those. Also, this week, a letter of the state of the church has been sent out. Uh, if you are missing it or didn't get it, or just want a copy, we've got a couple extra copies up here for that. And Rebecca is looking for a volunteer to post the messages out on the sign at the street. Uh, we change that often? Weekly? Oh, we should change it weekly, but every other week. Okay. So she'd give you the message, you just go out and put, put the numbers and letters on. You gonna do it? Yeah, I'm good at it. You okay? Yeah, I'll give you the stuff. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so we got, we got a success there. And then finally, uh, it's a busy time of the year for Cheryl on the year end. Uh, accounting and reporting and all that has to be done, plus she's dealing with her son Hunter who has medical issues, so we need to pray for Cheryl uh, to get through this kind of rough period for her. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I am so glad to see you here. I do this much better when I have faces in front of me. But we do need to get home in case it... Oh, I thought I did. I'm sure you all couldn't hear me, right? Is it working now? No? I did have that. Oh, it's not. It's not red. It's dead. Thank you. All right. Um, there was one. <coughs> I wanted to let you know you have an orange sheet on your front of your bulletin that says dreams and visions. That is about what we would like to see our church do in like the next three years. Or, you know how we want to see our church. How we want to, to how we want to be. Um, so that we have, and then once we figure that out, then we have something to say to people when, when they say, well, what are you doing to your church? Or, you know, we have this. And, and hopefully it'll help with everything else. But anyway, so I, we kind of wanted to have some ideas from you guys because you are the ones that are part of the church. Now, the other thing is, uh, Janet Brown has volunteered <coughs> to be uh, and already been approved to be missions chair. So if you're interested in being on the missions committee, let me know, and we will get that get that information to Janet and let her know. The last thing I wanted to talk about is that the uh, week for uh, prayer for Christian unity starts on the 18th and goes to the 25th. It's something the World Council of Churches uh, created. I think this is an interesting thing because it's Christian unity. We're not talking about everywhere. We're talking about Christians being unified. And the quote that the World Council of Churches says is, as we renew our commitment to this call to be in unity, 
May this love strengthen our unity as Christians. And the theme for this year is you shall love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself. There are, uh, online there are things that you can do for each day uh, through the World Council of Churches. You can read about it. It's something that used to have a lot of push, but it doesn't now. Uh, I, I think that's just in general the way church is right now. So, so anyway, I just want to let you all know that the fitness for Christian unity. It might be something that will spark a conversation between you and someone else. Now, let's stand and sing where the Spirit of the Lord is. Uh, about uh, 
where do we go from here? And we're going to use Luke 24, verses 13 through 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they came, did not find his body there, they came back and told us they had seen an angel, a vision of angels, who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead of them as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. I'm going to keep on going. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and why do, you, do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that I, it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of royal fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, These are the words I, that I have spoken while while I still was with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead, and on the third day, and on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of all these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. I guess I could have gone on. Um, now, the weird thing is, I, I read this in different Bibles I have, you know, just from the study Bible, one's got this one, and they all, they all sound different. So sometimes when I read it, I think, I read the right thing. So you'll have to see. Now, here they are. These two guys, these aren't one of the 12 disciples, or the 11 disciples. We know that. 
from the reading. And we also know that they're, um, they're probably going home and they're taking a seven mile walk because it's been three days and they're confused. Probably they had to go home for a reason because most of them, as you noticed in the scripture, they all seem to be together, gathered together. Um, I, the way that Luke is written, because the same person wrote Acts, this sounds like it's the same day or right after that that, that the Pentecost that happened and because they're still all in that room. Because when you go to read Acts, Jesus says the same thing. He walks into the room and says, peace be with you. Except they say it's a lock. So uh, I think this is just the continuation of Acts and the Pentecost story. And that's why it sounds so so different uh, from, from Matthew and uh, or John. Okay, so you can imagine their loss. I mean, you know, their big leader guy. I mean, the person they relied on. This is more than, you know, if we think you know, think about the president, that doesn't, that doesn't affect us like it would everybody that worked with him. But if you had someone in your work or your family that you really relied on that did things for you, that you were, saw every day, uh, it, would, it would leave a hole. It, it does even when sometimes when it's not somebody that's close to you or whatever. It's, it, there are these things that we have these expectations about what this person fulfills in our life. And it, sometimes it just disappears, you know, when this person's gone. It's not there anymore. The habit isn't there. They are really lost. And they don't know what's going on. And they're afraid because the Romans are in them. So it's one of those things where they've got all these emotions and they're trying to just figure out the next step. And they can't figure out exactly where it is that they're going. So they, you know, they the momentum has gone, their purpose is gone, because Jesus is gone. I mean, that was what they did. They followed Jesus too, and they did what he needed them to do. Maybe he sent them out to another town, but then they came back. You know, and so it was always Jesus that kept them going. And now they don't have Jesus. They don't have anything at all. I remember when my grandmother passed away, um, I lived with her for a little while when my mom was really sick and before my sister was born. And so we were always pretty close. Uh, she tolerated me very well. <laughs> anyway, when, uh, when she died, my parents and my sister and her family and uh, us and our family were all in Arizona. And we were on a vacation and she died. And there was no way we could get back fast enough. Yeah, I mean, it was already over. And Gary, or my dad's sister was there with, or, or got there right after, I guess they called her, and so she was in Tennessee, so she got there and, and took care of everything. And they didn't have a funeral. They didn't have any kind of service whatsoever. They uh, cremated her and they took her and did, you know, put her with her husband. And uh, we were still in Arizona. And it was kind of odd. I, I, I know that these days we've had, we had a couple of people that were, worked for Gary that have passed away in the last two months, and neither one of those had a service. It's beginning to be one of those things that we don't do anymore. Mainly because, like with my parents, all of the family was gone except for the two of us. So there wasn't, maybe they had a few friends, but most of those were gone because they were in their 90s. They, you know, they had outlived a huge amount of people, and I guess that's probably what's happening nowadays. But I know that I, it took me a while to feel regular about it, and I can remember after we left Arizona, went back home, and something happened, and I stood up to go call my grandmother because I wanted to tell her about it. And then I remember she wasn't there. And I, th I think that was the first time I went, I can't call her anymore. I don't have that connection anymore. And it was really kind of a, a bummer time. And I think that these disciples, all of them, you know, not just the 11, but all of these people that have been following Jesus all this time, felt this very big hole in everything because their momentum had come to a screeching stop. And they didn't know what to do. And then there was this, this news about him not being dead. You know, and what, 
whoa, wait, wait, what do we do with that? Does that mean he's coming back? Oh, good. It'll turn out just the way it used to be. Well, not really. You know, it, it was not anything like that they could handle. And it was really confusing. And I think sometimes in our, our lives, we, we get like that and we kind of stop. I think COVID did that for us. You know, all of a sudden we all stopped our routine. We, we, we went in a different direction. So anyway, we have this passage and, and the, you know, that it gives us pause. You know, it gives us pause. You know, when Jesus talks in verse 17, he says, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Which I think is a really weird sentence, but anyway. And I, you know, it's like he walked up to him and went, hey, what's up? You know, they, and they're like, have you not, you know, have you been living under a rock? You don't know what's going on. But I kind of wonder if what Jesus was asking them, you know, we were just talking about this, Doug, I mentioned it, and Doug was, and I were talking about the fact that a lot of times men can't find things. And so wives spend a lot of time looking for things for men. And, and, and then I think that works here. You know, they're walking along and they're upset. And they don't know what's going on. And they're talking about all the things that have gone on. And this guy walks up to him. And I don't know what time it was, but, you know, maybe it was dark already. But it's, they say it's almost dark when they get there. But, you know, they never look at him to see who he is. And I think that, you know, maybe he was look, he was waiting for them to recognize him. They, he was waiting for them to recognize that this was not the end, but the beginning of something else. And so it was one of those things where it, it took a moment for him to, for them to uh, figure out what's going on. And, and verse 25 and 26, he says, uh, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And then he starts telling him the whole story. And I, that's why I thought he was talking about their faith. Because he's going, I've told you this story before. You all are Jewish. You know the story from the beginning of time on that these things are going to happen. I've told you in, you know, when we've gathered that this is going to happen to me, and yet that hasn't entered their minds. Oh, this is part of the plan. This is what's going to, you know, they really didn't know. I mean, he even says that he'll be back, and they totally forgot. It. And I wonder sometimes if that's kind of the way we are when we, um, when we get to a point where we don't know what we're going to do. We forget to look ahead and not and not keep looking backward. We keep thinking about how things are, how we um, should should be, and you know the world just never stops moving, and so it never is the same. And yet we keep doing the same things, and the church has done the same thing since the end of the 18th century. We really haven't changed that much. We didn't go to a different day. You know, some churches have more than one service, but we never, um, we didn't keep this day for ourselves. Number one, everybody goes to work now. Everybody stays home. So it's, you know, it's the only day they get to sleep late because all their kids have activities on Saturday or you have to go to work on Saturday or whatever. So we, this, all this has changed. We're still Sunday morning thing and and we're still doing VBS and we're still doing uh, you know special services that people don't even know I mean how many people know what Ash Wednesday really is other than it's a church holiday you know there may be a huge amount of people who, when they try buying this on the sign out there what the heck are they going to do with ashes or what's a, what's so big about this Wednesday actually it's this year it's on uh, Valentine's Day <laughs> so maybe they'll go, does this have something to do with Valentine's Day? You know? So it's it's one of those things where we, we've continued to have the same mission, but the, everything has changed. Everything has changed. And so how are we going to move on? 
And so I thought maybe it would be good if we had our dreams and visions and we shared them on the board and we found maybe a way that we can begin with a different angle or a different way of being. And, and not only that, but it would rekindle our passion for church. You know, we would want to be here more often. We would want to be more involved. We would want to know what's going on. And so uh, I, that's what I was hoping for, with that we could move on. Because today's church just really hasn't, you know, we, we talked about growth in the 80s and 90s, you know, and that's when the contemporary services started and everybody had a band and everybody had a shield around their drums and, you know, it had, you had special services and that you still do to some extent. But that really wasn't a change. It was still on Sunday morning. It was still worship. So it fell in the parameters of, oh, okay, we're just doing something different for that day at that time. And it didn't really change us, or uh, I suppose the, the attempt was to make it more contemporary, more current. But really, Christian music isn't very contemporary either. Not very, you know, it's pretty, been, pretty much been the same for my lifetime. Well, no, that's not true. Amy Grant was more Western, country Western, but it evolved over time, so it has country Western music. So uh, that's more of a marketing thing than it is anything else. So when Jesus uses this time to explain all these things while they're on this this walk, you can see you can see in what they say about their hearts, they start paying more attention, and maybe they start seeing connections. You know, they see they see the keys on the counter. <laughs> they they know where the milk is in the refrigerator. And they, they become more and more interested in not only the history that he's talking about, but the history as it connects with Jesus' house. That, oh yeah, this is who they're talking about in Isaiah 40. This is who they're talking about in Isaiah 60. I can't, I can't remember. Anyway, all these, all these 43. 43 is a good one. Isaiah 43. And you know how much Jesus comment on Isaiah. That's what he used as his reference. And so all of a sudden it's starting to connect with it. And they're beginning to go, yeah, I get, I, I see what you're saying. I see what's going on. So they get to the end of this, the walk. They get in front of the house or wherever. And Jesus says, I'm going on. And they say, oh, no, no, no. And see, they still haven't figured out who he, who he is. It's just like the people at the tomb didn't know who he was. And, uh, and and they convince him to stay. They convince him to stay, have a meal with them, and to stay with them for a while. So we have this beautiful scene of them setting. There's a, I can't remember if it's Caravaggio, but it's probably Caravaggio or Rembrandt because it's got all that light inside of the scene. Or Charles Bureau, I guess you'd say. If you know what that is. Anyway, of the three of them sitting there at the table, and Jesus breaks that bread and blesses it, just like he did at communion, not more than a week, ten days ago. And they see who he is. And immediately he vanishes. Which makes it even more confusing. <laughs> so then they have to figure out, you know. But they that's when they go, oh my gosh, that's why I, I felt like that. It was him talking to us. It was, it was him giving us hope, making a connection. This is exciting. Let's go back to Jerusalem. So you know they probably got up and it was dark and they walked back to Jerusalem and it was probably four in the morning when they got there. But they find the 11. They find all the disciples. They're in a room together. And they tell them about this, that, that this is so exciting. This is so exciting. We saw Jesus. It was him. And, and, you know, and they're probably all discussing, oh, well, that's what the girls said when they went to the tomb. And I don't know if I believe that. And they go down and tell them something. I don't believe it at all. <laughs> you know? and, and all this is going on. And here's Jesus walks in. And he says, peace be with you. I probably would have thrown up. <laughs> that would have been, that would, it would have been so shocking that I, I, I can't imagine 
He put Crawley Faith. But anyway, but my, uh, most of them, because of the time and the uh, fear of ghosts and spirits, you know, they probably all step back away from him. And he knows exactly what's happening. And so he says, it's me. Look, look at my hands, look at my feet. Look, it's me. I got muscle on me. You know, I'm skin and bones. And, you know, and they're still like, because, you know, how often do you see a ghost in your lifetime? It's not like you have a comparison. So, so he says, give me something. Now, this was the proof in ancient times. This was the proof between something being a spirit and something being real. Is if they ingested food. Because everybody knows a ghost of me. Except on the Ghostbusters. So, but anyway, so they, they realize it's him they get so excited all over again and they begin to praise him and they begin to be very excited about this and you know they're not sure exactly what it means but just having Jesus there fills them with so much joy and so much hope and so they praise him and everything but you know before in the midst of all this you know Jesus says when they back off why are you troubled why are you sad and here again, I think he's not acting, he's not talking about anything except their faith. Why do you doubt? I've already told you. And so to us, he repeats the, the two sentences, or the sentence that he said to the two disciples that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. And you are witnesses of these things. We too are witnesses of these things. And we too are to preach and the remission of sins. Because we are the body of Christ now. That's our responsibility. And we've gotten away from that. We have, we've gotten so busy trying to jack up numbers and be big and, and have all this fancy stuff, which is not bad. But it's, it's your only focus, and you're not focusing on changing people's lives, on the transformation that happens when Christ is there. You can get a bunch of people to join a church, but they don't have to be committed. They don't. They can just come on Sunday, and they can feel good about it, and they will tell you that. That I go to church because it makes me feel good. And it should. It should make you feel good. But it also should be the beginning point of the week of ministry. How are you going to do ministry on Monday through Saturday? How are you going to walk? What are you going to say to people? Are you going to be loved? You know, our uh, theme that you have on, that's on the begin, front of the bulletin that says where love works, I really think it should say, you know, I probably won't do this wrong, uh, do love, be loved, give love, after it says where the love works. Because that's what we need to do. We not only need to be loved, we need to give love. We need to make sure that people know that we're giving them love. When in whatever way it is. And sometimes it's going to be in ways which are directly opposite to what that person is saying to you. Like if they're challenging you or they're um, questioning what you're doing or uh, just looking at you like, why the heck are you talking to me? You know, it has to be that we are giving that love. Not only that we act like we're you know, being nice, but that we give it to them. I've seen Kathy DiGiovanni do it so many times where she blesses people. It just, she, she's got that from the Catholic Church and she does it without even a pause. She blesses people. And I think that is amazing. And it's something that is her witness. She's really doing it. And most of the time, People are, might be surprised, but they're appreciative. Isn't that amazing? They are so hungry to know that there is peace and love in the world that they are appreciative of those things. And if they're not, they're probably going to think about it for a while, and then they'll be appreciative. But our mission is to, to, to witness and to preach, and we can do that in the way we act, in the way we show compassion, in the words that we say preach in a lot of different ways. 
but it's something we need to do. Now, Jesus tells him at the end of his little speech about he's sending the promise of the Father. And I have to tell you that when I thought, saw that, I thought, which promise? Because there are so many times that God has promised, you know, he promised in the very beginning of uh, the Old Testament that he wouldn't, wouldn't flood the world anymore. Well, okay, is it that promise? Or is it the promise that we have that God loves us all the time? Or is it the promise that the kingdom of God will come? And what promise is he talking about? But who cares? They're all really good. It doesn't really matter. His promise here is for the Holy Spirit, but it really makes you think God promises lots of things. So we have major amounts of hope because we have a lot of things that are good that are going to happen, that are happening right now, that are ha always happening. God is always with us. It's really scary because we really, I know I have always with us. But there have been, that the ministry that he is asking them to do, to wait until they're filled with the Spirit or something from on high, I don't remember. But all of that so that they can go do what they need to do. We are fortunate. Holy Spirit is with us all the time. We don't have to look for it. I, I still, I really want to ask a theologian sometime, you know, why, how, how we connect with the Holy Spirit. We connect with Jesus through the story. We connect with God through what God says. You know, we have some sort of um, dialogue going, but the Holy Spirit we know. And I want, I want to know more about the Holy Spirit. I want to know how it connects with. I want to know what it does. Like Jesus says that the Holy Spirit hears what he says and tells you. Does that mean? Uh, yeah. It, it, it just, it's just one of those things that we've never, I think it's because it doesn't have a name. The Holy Spirit is nameless. Holy Spirit. I mean, is that the first name and the last name? So, you know, it, it kind of is scary, but it is the one thing that we need to, I think we, if we could connect to more often, or with a, a continuance of strength that it would fill us with so much joy that we would we would never have a bad day because we would have that to, to go with us. But that's what we need to do. We need to find out how worship feeds us and then we go out. That it's not worship and then the rest of the world, but you don't live in that world. You've already committed to Christ. You live in a different world. You live in the world that they talk about in Romans. You know, be be in the world, but don't be of the world. We have different things that go on with us. And we need to always make those, sure that those are first. And one of the ways that those are first is community. And when we're in community. And how we can hold each other up. And help each other. Not only in our lives, but in our ministry. So there, there are ways that we can do that. And that's why I think that we need to rekindle the fire of our passion for church. We need to be moving. If so, we get excited like those, those uh, disciples were on the road. Like the disciples were in that, in that room. They got so excited because there was so much going on. And they were going to help put it out there. Now, they were ready to go, ready to break out of that building and go. And so that's why I asked for your dreams and visions because you know what you love, what you can do, and now we need to know as a church what we can all love.
blessing. Open our eyes, O oh Lord, and let the light that shone on in Jesus shine in us and through us. And let the light fall also on our neighbors, that we might become one in our witness to that which dwells in every person's every person born on earth. Amen.